Peter's long sermon today is the uh, first chapter of Peter, but it's really not that long. It's only 25 verses. I'm breaking out it so it do not seem like it's that big. But the uh, um, biggest thing that I have is a quick question is where do you put your hope at? I find that a lot of people put their hope in uh, money or business deals or celebrities or politicians, and it can be easy to do that type of thing. I find that that's where we tend to get ourselves trapped as we're putting our hope in things that don't really have value. We're putting our hope and our trust and our faith in, in people who can fail so easily, people who will lie to you or cheat you or use you or abuse you. And it's, a, it's, it's very, very common because a lot of us tend to have a trusting nature about us. We're, we're, we make ourselves so easily used. We, we just want to trust people. We want to be good to people. We want to listen to people who have high seats and statures around us. And we want to trust them. And we want to just, just be able to. And they use it. And it just happens over and over and over again. But there's one who wants you to trust them and trust them and lean into them, and that's Jesus. And so many of us forget to put our trust and our hopes and our faith in him above all things. And that's what Peter is trying to point out here. He writes this letter to a big group of people. We see that in the opening. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in abundance. Those two verses, they, they seem like, oh, it's just the introduction, but it tells us that he's writing to a large group of people, to a widespread church all over Asia Minor there, and uh, Eastern Europe. People forget Greece and Turkey are on two different continents. Now, a lot of these towns are in Turkey, which is part of Asia, and some are in Greece, which is part of Europe. He's talking about spread all over the world as they knew it. So it would be easy today to include America and England and France and any other country around the world that has Christian church in it. He's talking to us. And it's important that we remember this. This isn't just an ancient text that was for the people back then. This there's a reason we say that the Word of God is a living scripture, it's a living word, because it still carries on to us today. This message doesn't die off, it doesn't end, it doesn't stop, it continues on for each and every generation. And the only way it's going to stop is when Jesus comes back. One of the things to consider is when you're watching a play, it's not over until the director steps off stage, right? Our director hasn't stepped back on stage yet. He stepped out 2,000 years ago and introduced it to us. He introduced his gospel. He introduced his message of hope and faith and love and mercy and grace. And that play has been carrying on for over 2,000 years. He has not come back on stage yet. So until he is, we need to play our part and be listening to his word. It's still relevant today. Well, Peter goes on in here, starting verse 3. It says, blessed, to, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfaithful, kept in heaven for you. You are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And those simple verses right there tell us all we really need to know about what Jesus brought to us. One, he is the Son of God. He is the Son of the living God. He, he brought us mercy and a new birth into a living hope through his resurrection. It doesn't say that Jesus is still in the grave because he's not. He was risen. He was resurrected from death. He conquered death for us. He was crucified for us. His blood was spilt for us, and it's through his blood that we are saved. So he gives us a living hope. See, that hope we have in money, that hope we have in riches, that hope we have in politicians, that hope we have in celebrities, that hope we have in all these things of the world, the hope you have in America is a dying hope. Every country in the past has ended. The current countries today will also at some point. I pray that it's not in our lifetime. But it could be. It could be. A matter of a few years of war can end the country. Or create one. We have no idea what that country is going to be like until we get started. So that hope that you put in those things, that hope you put in gold, that hope you put in money, it's all a dying hope because money can run out. Gold can lose value. Look at the stock market itself. It's down. It's all over the place. It loses value. It's a dying hope. Jesus Christ, there's no ending. It's imperishable. It doesn't stop. It's a living hope. There's no end. It says it's imperishable, it's undefiled, and it's unfading. It means it's not going away. Jesus Christ is not going away. What he has done for us, the mercy he has brought to us, the salvation and the sanctification he has given us doesn't end. You know, his mercies don't even end if you mess up. But I promise you, I can mess up every single day. His mercies are still there. If I have to ask forgiveness over and over and over again, he's still going to give it to me. He told Peter to forgive your enemy 40 times, or 7 times 7. And it's just, that's a crazy number. It's a crazy number when you think about it. Yes, for us, oh yeah, that's 490 times. That's a lot of forgiveness. Are you going to forgive somebody for the same offense 490 times? I don't have that name. Jesus does. After two or three times, I'm going to be prone to cut them off. Jesus doesn't cut us off. And I think that's what he was telling Peter. Don't give up on me. Don't give up on me. Because I'm not going to give up on you. Peter goes on, verse 6, it says, In this... In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials. He says it's not easy. In this life there's going to be suffering. And even so, rejoice. How many of us get sick? Yeah. <laughs> rejoice. 
How many of us have hard times with money? Some, yeah, rejoice. Don't put your hope in your health. Don't put your hope in your wealth. Don't put your hope in anything else but Jesus Christ and you can rejoice through any hard time that comes along. Paul and Silas staying in the prison and the chains were loose. They were in prison, in chains, armed guards around them. And they were rejoicing. Because in this, you rejoice even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the gener genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that so perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. He gives us a reason for the rejoicing. So that our genuineness of our faith which is more precious than gold, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Who's going to find the praise and glory and honor in our faith when Jesus is revealed? God is. But who's it going to be revealed to? We already know Jesus. We already see Jesus as Christian. To reveal to the other people, the unbelievers, when they see that you can rejoice through all of that, when your faith is tested by the fire and you still cling to Jesus, they're going to notice that. And they're going to go, I want what they've got. Because when hard times come on unbelievers, they give up. They fall into a deep, dark depression where they can't figure it out. Guess what? I can be depressed and still rejoice because of Jesus. I've been there. I know many of you have. Depression is a dark, dark place for a lot of people. It's very, very real. But when you have Jesus, you have a hope that is living that you can cling to. But when you do see the light of the coming, you know that it's Him. When you do reach the mountaintop, you know that it's Him who lifted you up. No matter if you're walking in the valley, if you're in the darkness, if you're in the lowest pit of your life, or if you're on every mountaintop, every peak that you could possibly be on, and everything is perfect, look up to Jesus. That's where you find your hope. Not in all the things of this world. Those things fade. Those things go away. Verse 8, although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. It's not the works you put into it, it's your faith that brings the salvation of your soul. He says, even though you he says, although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. I have really nothing to compare that to in this world except maybe parenthood. When the child's still being born inside the mother's womb, you can't see him or her. You love him. I know mothers probably feel that a lot more than fathers, but I know as a father, that's something that I look forward to as a new parent. I couldn't see the girl. I 
and I already love them. I can't see Jesus all the time. I can't see God all the time. But I know that I love them. And people who are lost in the world can't quite grasp that. They're like, how can you believe in somebody you can't see? How can you love someone you can't see? How can you trust someone you can't see? I don't know how to explain it, but I can. I just, just can. Saying that on a cloudy day, I know the sun's still shining, but I can still feel the warmth. I can still see the light coming through the clouds. I know God is there because I can see the miracles that he created all around me. I can see a flower that has no business whatsoever breaking through a concrete slab, but it does. It's so delicate you can just pick it. How do you get that? No matter how many times we do, it's coming back. favorite part about hunting is the coming back with the deal instead of quiet just means God creates when there's nothing else going on around you you can hear every part of the forest you can see his creation at its best Take the world out of it. How can I believe in someone I can see? It's a lot easier than you think. How can I love them? Even astrophysicists tell you if the Earth is one degree closer or whatever, we burn up to the sun if we're same distance further away with freeze to death we're in the perfect spot tell me that's not my design like if you tell me that just happened then uh, that HP computer sitting on my desk disappeared I'm sorry but there was a designer behind it that doesn't just happen because of the heck I can rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. Oh, this day is horrible. How come you got a smile on your face? I wish I could smile like you all day. You know, I got told that this week. I was thinking it was cooler than last week, so that's probably why. But, but I got told that this week. Is I wish I could smile all day like you do. I say, get deep. They just looked at me, don't tell The only reason, I promise. <laughs> Peter goes on and says, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours made careful search and inquiry. Inquiring about the person or the time that the Spirit of Christ within them indicated when he testified in advance to the suffering, suffering destined for Christ and the subsequent glory. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in regard to the things that, <clears throat> that have now been announced to you through those who brought you good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. I had to read those few verses over and over. <laughs> Basically, it's saying that the prophets looked at the prophecies repeatedly. They searched and inquired. They questioned over and over just to 
discover that Christ came exactly when God intended him to. Suffered exactly how God intended him to and died exactly the way that he needed to so that we might be saved. The prophets discovered that what they were serving, what they were doing, what they were saying to the people around them was for our glory so that we might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How crazy is that? 400 plus years before Jesus came, the prophets were saying, He's coming. Now there's some math and stuff you can do in the book of Daniel. It's all laid out. Timeline. I don't have time to dive into it. It is a lot. But it's all laid out in the book of Daniel. From the Babylonians, to the Medes, to the Persians, to the Greeks, to the Romans, and boom, they're Jesus. And it worked out exactly the way Daniel described. The strength and the structure of each empire as it came up, to what it would look like when Jesus came. And even after that. prophets knew that the Messiah was coming. And they knew he was coming to save us. To save them. To save every single person throughout all of history. If they would accept him as their source of faith. And they knew that it would be good news that we would hear from the Holy Spirit and that we would receive things that the angel longed for. Think about that. A third of the angels rebelled against heaven and were cast into the pits of hell. All the angels longed for what we have received. We get to sing songs that the angels can't because we know what grace from God is. He was a lot harsher than them than he was to us. They were supposed to be perfect. And he gave us more grace than he gave them. I'm saying all of that, same as Peter here, to tell you this. Don't waste that hope. That living hope that we have. It gives every single one of us a purpose to live a different life, to be a different person, to be a different creature than we once were before we knew Jesus. Peter goes on in verse 13 and says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action, not for idleness. He says, for action. Prepare your mind. He says, study first, learn first. Then discipline yourself. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring to you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you as holy, be holy yourself in your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He's saying, change the way you're living. Change your attitude. Change your verbiage. Change everything about you. But understand that it's not you who changed, but Christ who changes you. You become holy not because you yourself are holy, but because he is holy. And you allow him to shine through you. And I think that's something that we all have to remember is that we've got to let go at some point. It's not giving up freedom. It's actually becoming more free. Because you let go of this worldly, human desire. You 
given to what he originally had planned for. C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity that God can show himself as he really is only to real men. And that means not simply to men who are individually good, but to men who are united together in a body, loving one another, helping one another, showing him to one another. For that is what God meant humanity to be like, like players in one band or organ in one body. How many of us try and go at all alone? We're all parts of one body. We're all parts of one body of Christ. We get mad at other churches because they have different little traditions and stuff. Where we never stop to consider maybe we're an arm and they're a leg. It's going to be a little different. They have a different purpose. Maybe that other church is an eye ear over here. Why does the ear try and tell the eye how to see? They should be more concerned with how to live. Work together in one body. Common goal is to bring Christ to as many people as possible. We can't do that if we work against each other. Verse 17 says this, if you invoke as Father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. It says, if you invoke, if you're going to speak as Father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, if you're going to talk about him, if you're going to act like you know him and you trust him and you believe in him, it says then you need to live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. Let's talk about it. While you're here and not in the kingdom that you belong to, think about that. We are exiles in a foreign land. We belong to the kingdom of God. So while we're here, we should live in reverent fear of the one that we're speaking about. It means that we reveal him to others. We have reverence to him. We hold him above other things and other people. But we should live like we belong to him and not to the people down here. We are so quick to tell people, hey, I'm an American. But we shy away from telling them I'm a Christian. When we're exiles in this land, when we belong to that kingdom, we should be telling people first, hey, I'm a Christian. And I live in America.
had to do that every year. Every year you'd come and you'd bring a lamb or you'd bring doves or you'd bring whatever and they would slaughter it and bless your house and that covered you for the year. Jesus did it so that we were covered for eternity. Because none of those lambs would come back from the dead. That had to be done over and over again. Jesus conquered death for us. He is the perfect sacrifice for us. And it says that's what he was destined for before the foundation of the earth. Before the world was even created. Before God spoke the word that created this world. He already knew he would have to sacrifice his son. And he waited until there was a worldwide empire with mailing systems and roads and highways and communication like never before. So that it could spread like never before. That his son was sacrificed, not just for the Jews, but for all people. Every That through him, through Jesus, you have come to trust in God. Who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. So that your faith and your hope are set on God. It says now, in verse 22, now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. So that you have genuine mutual love. Love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. We have been born anew through the living and enduring word of God. Jesus Christ made us something that we were not before. He created in us a different type of person. One that's capable of loving one another and working together, even when we don't get along. Even when our worldly ideas and our worldly vision are skew of each other. It's only through Jesus that we're able to do that. We watch this world over and over and over again. And we see too often that people talk a good game and speak good speech and have good intentions and say, oh, we need to trust people, we need to love people, we need to work together until your ideas clash with them. I've seen plenty of people say, oh, children should be able to make their own decisions, okay? I don't know why people thought to do this, but it's fun to watch, actually. Those people saying children need to make their own decisions. And you look at them and go, what if that child decides to be a Christian? Oh, they freak out. What if that child wants to be conservative? Oh, they freak out. What if that child wants to be liberal? Conservatives freak out. It's weird to watch because they don't know what love is. Their idea of love is tolerance. Love is truth. You love like Jesus loved it. Jesus loved all people. He flipped the table to the temple and they dishonored his father. And he's still preaching to those people, trying to get them to understand the truth that was coming from God. Surprisingly, that's love. As a child, an immature child, Incapable of making my own decision, I thought my parents hated me when they did something. As a parent, I realized they loved me. They wanted me to be better than that immature. Nowadays, people want to take discipline out of it because they're afraid you're a 
using the time.
carry that joy out into the world no matter what's going on. That we stop putting our hope in politics and in gold and in all the perishable things of this world, Lord, but we put our hope in you and we make those decisions based on your glory and your glory alone. That we listen to you more than we listen to our own heart's desires, our own human desires, Lord, we trust in you. Why kingdoms and nations and countries fall and fail and fight all around us, Lord, we know that your kingdom will not fail. And that we are exiled here <coughs> belonging to your kingdom and your kingdom alone. Lord, I ask that you give us the grace and the wisdom to live a life according to your glory. Lord, I ask all of this in the blessed name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.